from The Advocate Magazine in partnership with GLAAD. This is LGBTQ and A. I'm Jeffrey Masters, and I think that when we talk about quote-unquote coming out, that is not a precise way of describing the queer or trans experience for many people. We tend to tell these tight little narratives where you're in the closet or you're out. It's black and white. And for many people, it's not that simple. Take Charles M. Blow, for example. Charles was married to a woman who knew he was bi, and after that marriage ended, he dated men and women. So while he didn't publicly talk about these relationships before 2014, that was when his memoir called Fire Shut Up and My Bones came out. I don't think it's fully accurate to say that he was in the closet. We have private and public coming outs in life, always. Sometimes it's something you have to do every single day. And so today in the podcast, Charles is here to talk about that and more. Charles is a longtime columnist for the New York Times, one I've been reading for years, and is also now hosting a brand new nightly news show that is called Prime with Charles Blow and is on the Black News Channel. I want to start off by talking about your memoir. Because in it, you write about the term bisexual, and you say that technically it's correct for you, but that you do not embrace or use that word. You cited it as having derisive connotations. So that was back in 2014. Do you still feel that way about that word? No, I I was using it when the memoir was published. I mean, I talk about how afraid it is, but I also, first of all, I don't understand why we run away from labels or are worried about labels. Like, it's not a big thing. Like, I'm going <laughs> to I'm gonna have the life I'm going to have anyway. Whatever you call it is not going to change how I live and how I love a bit. So I don't find any, I'm not caught up in the label as much or tied to it or feel like, you know, I, if you don't get my label right, I'm going to be offended. Listen, do whatever you want to do, because I'm going to do what I want to do. But I find it is an easy way to describe my attractions. I mean, I think that, like, for all the progress we've made in terms of, like, awareness, understanding for sexualities, we've done a astonishingly poor job at, like, demystifying bisexuality. There are so many stigmas that still remain. Right. There are stigmas that remain, remain. And also, the idea of bisexuality, actually, people take as a challenge to absolute binary identities. The idea that someone could move, could be fluid and move in and out of an identity is a challenge to the people who are singularly attracted to men or women. It's it's an incredible challenge to the binary construct. And so people want to say, well, it doesn't, you must be on the path to something. You're bi now and gay in five years. That's the, you know, or three years, whatever, you know, how people think about it. So I understand all those things. But the assumption that if someone tells you that this is our identity and you completely deny that is incredibly offensive because you're basically saying the person is lying. I think that to your point, many people have used bi to be on the path to queerness and that we are like a single story kind of like society. You know, if I personally came out as bi before I came out as gay, that means that everybody also has the exact same path because of this, like, I trust the one story of myself. Yeah, yes, it's complicated in that that way, I guess, if it's not your life. So for me, it's not, there's nothing complicated about the way my brain works because that is the way it has always worked. The denial was always trying to be part of a binary, trying to be a part of the straight world or trying to be completely part of the gay world when I'm like, for a very long time, I didn't even believe that there were completely straight and gay people. I just thought everybody else was hiding it. I could not believe that there was not a single person of the other gender or whatever you attract to, but the others, that you were not attracted to. How? How is that possible? Like that, my, that's my, what my brain was doing because my brain was not making the distinction between people. It was, I find these things to be attractive in human beings. And I can find a lot of them in this group of human beings. And I can find some of them in this group of human beings too. And whenever I find it, I like it. So tell me this, when the book came out again, 2014, was that when you publicly came out and started talking about it? Yes. Or were you out before Yes, then? it is. Yes, it is. So why was that the right time to start doing that? Oh, it wasn't the right time. I mean, it was like the Times had made me a columnist. In the very first moment, I knew what that meant, that I was now a public figure and not a private figure. 
you know, and my role model in that is James Baldwin, who talked about why he had been so public about being gay, because he was like, that means that you cannot blackmail me. I knew that from a life in newspapers, that if you tell your own story, it belongs to you. If somebody else tells your story, it belongs to them. And they're not going to be as kind to you as you will be to yourself. So it was incumbent upon me, number one, to share my life because it's protective. It is also important to share that story because I'm going to be writing about other people's lives. I cannot do that while hiding a secret in my own. And, and up until becoming a public figure, it didn't even feel like it was a secret. If, you know, if my, I had gotten married, my ex-wife knew everything about me. I told her literally everything. I probably see this detail. But like, I felt like as long as the people, you know, the person who I had committed myself to love and be in relationship and be in marriage with, as long as I had been completely honest with that person, it was nobody else, else's business. So you weren't living a closeted life of like avoiding like gay bars before that? No, when I was married, I was just monogamous. So yes, I was avoiding gay bars. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm uh, saying like pre-2014 when you publicly came out. No, no, no. So I, I, that period, you know, I was, I would go out. But, you know, like, it was like, I go out to straight bars, I go to gay bars. I had girlfriends, I dated guys. Like, it was, it felt to me very natural expression of me. So there's a period in there where I am out and about and people know me. I have friends in all spaces, gay and straight. And yet I am not identifying in any public space as bi or gay or queer or anything. And so that is a period where... You're living a life of a bisexual man, but nobody, you haven't said it out loud publicly to anybody. So that is closeted. There's no other way to describe that. You know, you, it doesn't feel good. You can rationalize, I don't need to say anything. I'm, you know, you can see me, whatever. But it, it still doesn't quite feel honest, honorable, and brave. So that, I guess that is another rationale for writing a book, in, in addition to the other reason I mentioned, which is just, it's just liberating. Like you just, there's no more worrying, hiding. Even when you don't feel like you're completely hiding, there is some part of you that is, you know, if, if it were not a thing, then everybody would know. All of your friends would know. Everybody in your family would know. If it was truly not a thing. So the fact that they don't, then that means it's a thing. I mean, do you feel like you missed out on being like young and dumb and like queer? No, because th that that just sounds messy. But <laughs> it is, I promise. <laughs> no, I'm just joking about that. And listen, I don't I don't have regrets about my relationships I've had and the people I've loved. I don't. So I can't say that I regret that because in my 20s I was very much in love and I was married and I had kids and I could have had that life for the rest of my life. If, if that marriage had not stopped, I was perfectly comfortable in it and happy with it. So no, I don't miss that. What I do sometimes think about though is, you know, when you are not living an honest, open, true life, you are taking advantage of a privilege granted to you by older gay, lesbian, queer of some way, people who have sacrificed tremendously so that you could come into this place. And they did so very openly, very often, and at great cost. And you're giving up nothing. And in fact, you know, not even giving the world the visibility that, oh, me too. So that never, that felt crappy. That felt like you're taking advantage of something to which you owe a debt. Part of disclosure helps you pay that debt because you add your visibility. I want to make sure that I'm not saying to teenagers, when you don't have a home to call your own and you don't have a place to go because you have to go to that school or other that, otherwise that's truancy, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about the 30-year-old man. What, no, well, how old was I? I was 37-year-old man. I want to make sure that I say there's nothing preventing you come, from coming out. Now there's so little to lose, and yet I still didn't do it. Right. So and yet I still waited until, you know, the book comes out. I'm 44 years old. I still let people have the impression if they wanted to have it, that I was straight and I didn't disabuse them of that. And there was nothing for me to lose other than the approval of people who didn't really know me because they didn't know that part about me. 
You labeling that like disapproval from other people, though, that's not insignificant. I mean, it was enough to keep you, you know, in the closet, as you said. So I think you have to weigh the suffocation of your soul against whether or not the approval of other people is more important than that. There's no way to for you to live a true life if you're living a lie for them. And also, what does it mean? At, at the end of the day, part of my decision was just like, I can't even be an honorable man unless I do this. I think of myself as incredibly courageous and brave and nothing can knock me down. And no, I'm not. If I, if I can't do that, then I can't lay claim to any of that bravery of valor. So in order for me to see myself as, as, you know, to be the person that I saw myself as, which is a courageous fighter for the vulnerable, I had to fight for me and say, to hell with whatever comes of it. You don't want to be a part of my life anymore? Fine. And I had the privilege of doing that because I was older. What was I waiting for? There is nothing worth slowly killing yourself on the inside on the weight of a lie. No, no other person's disapproval could ever compare to your own disapproval of yourself. But with your coming out, you had the added complexity of having three kids. Was that conversation something you worried about having with them? Not really. I mean, they are incredibly egalitarian, really smart, cosmopolitan children. We have this thing in our family we would call like family meetings where we would sit down, you know, when something big happens, sit at the dining room table and just our family meeting, we talk and everybody gets a chance to talk and, you know, it's like a meeting. And so I had a family meeting, they came to the table, I had printed out manuscripts. I said, I've written this book, this is what's in it. And I gave them all a printed manuscript. Did you give them a heads up of like what they're going to find in there? No, yeah. I, we, I said, this is what, I've written a book. This is what's in it. Oh, okay. Because you also reveal like sexual assault and violence as a kid. That's all in there. So, okay. So you, you gave them a heads up for that. Gave them, I said, read. If there's any questions, you let me know. You know, they were like, you know, I've also been bullied. You know, like, that's how their minds work. They just, they immediately didn't think about that. They was just like, you know, I can, get, I can understand that. So that was kind of the way they thought about it. And when my, my oldest son, who is the fastest reader in the family, so he sat down, he read it all in one sitting. So by the end of the evening, he was finished. And he came to me and he says, you know, I just think you need to develop my mom's character more in that last chapter. Like it was an editorial note. It wasn't even about the content of the book. So like they are not phased in any way. They're just kind of, it's not how they think. So, so with the column in the TV show I want to talk about, you've written a tw- twice weekly column for the New York Times. Um, how, how long have you done that for? Well, the column started as a once every two week column, and that was 13 years ago. Is it just open parameters? Yes. There's no restrictions. No. So do you then have private guidelines for yourself about what to focus on? Well, you're most powerful if you write about what you are most passionate about. And so I try to just stick to things that I know that I can bring something to, that things that I am passionate about. Sometimes I feel like, oh, I should really, this is a big thing in the news. I should really tackle it. But I know that this is not my area of expertise. And I spend more time boning up on it than I would actually doing the writing. I often tell people what I write about is the vulnerable people and power. This is my internal parameters. You're not obligated to write about LGBTQ issues, but I wonder, like, how do you think about it? Because you really don't, you know, cover them. I mean, not that you have to, but you don't write about them very often. Well, sometimes I feel like soon after I became a columnist, Frank Bruni also became a columnist. And he was, I was writing a book about coming out, but he had already, obviously, already an uh, openly gay man. And so he became the first openly gay Columns, and he he wrote about it a lot. So I always felt like, okay, Frank is going to write about the grander things. I did write about things that were very specific to Black queerness. So I write up, wrote about more than once what the AIDS epidemic was doing to Black people in the South. They were never very well read. And I, I think part of it was also feeling a, a particular estrangement from the LGBT community. People were not, <laughs> people were not always kind of welcoming, and and I'm fine with it because I'm grown and I, don't, I really don't care, but they're not fine and welcoming when you come out and at an older age. And so the book I published was published when I was 44 years old. And people think, oh, it's easy to come out now because you're, you know, you are well off and you are older and you've, you know, I've suffered through this since I was 17 and you, you know, so it was, it was a lot. I got a lot of emails like that. 
almost always from white gay men. Almost always. So I just felt like, okay, <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to be a spokesman. And I always felt like that. I always felt like, let you guys have it. It's fine with me. I'm sorry, are you, just to clarify, are you saying that because you got so much hate mail when you came out that it like pushed you away from covering LGBTQ issues? No, I, I, I feel like there is an establishment of advocates and, and LGBT press that is not inclusive of people like me. I, I hope that that has changed since you came out. I, I don't know either way. However, to your point, we are very good at talking out of both sides of our mouth and saying, hey, come out when you're ready. There's no timeline, you know, take your time. And also like, how dare you wait this long, Charles Blow? Yes. And, and it wasn't just the wait too, too long. I mean, like, it is it is the wait too long. It is, there's no such thing as by your, your, you know, like the amount of people who've emailed me and told me things like that, it's just crazy. So I just said, you know what? I'm fine, and I just let it be what it is. And so I'll write about things as they are more intimate and closer to me because the, the, the power architecture around queerness has long been dictated by a very narrow band of people, and that wasn't, I wasn't in that. It's just, I just wasn't. Well, I think that now you are hosting shows at the Black News Channel, and, and there is not an answer to this, but I'm just going to say, it. my issue is like, I can watch your show and not know that you're part of my community. And I can like read your column and not know that. And it's not, it's not appropriate for you to bring it up every single column and every single show. But at the same time, I wonder like how many people are a fan of you and like, do not know that. See, that's very strange to me because I've written a whole book about it, a New York Times bestseller, They're making an opera about the book. I brag about all of this all the time. So I'm like, what do I have to do? And this is another part of it. When you don't have the affectation enough to please, right? You're not giving us enough cues. And that to me is also like very narrow. Like, what does that mean? That that queerness has a kind of built-in set of social cues? Or, like, that's cra- that sounds crazy to me. This is who I am. And in fact, it would it never pleased. Straight people would say, oh, there's something happening there. I think that you may be gay or bi because they didn't know. And the, and and I would get the other side from you, people like you who would say, like, I just can't tell. And I'm like, but what am I supposed to be doing? I don't understand. Well, you just need to hold your, like, limp wrist up higher. <laughs> so it's like, it's very strange. I never thought about that because maybe there is some, like, self-hatred, you know, coming from the people like me where it's like, I could never hide it, right? And like, how dare Charles be able to hide it? And then like, we just can't know. And 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 also, from my end, it's like, what does it mean to how dare you hide it when you're not hiding anything? Like, it just feels like this is my this is as natural as I know how to be. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. You know, with the protests that happened last summer, summer 2020. In your new book called The Devil You Know, you describe them as a social justice Coachella. Can you elaborate a bit more on what you meant by that for everybody? Well, the question was how sincere was the protest and how committed were people to it? And it's still, I think, an, a bit of an open question. It, you know, it, Those protests happened at the same time that America was experiencing a one- a, a global pandemic, which it had not experienced in a hundred years. Everybody's trapped at home. They're deprived of rites of passage. You can't go to prom. You can't go to concerts. There are no, you can't gather. You can't go to the mall. If you gather, even in small groups, you are shamed, if not arrested. But all of a sudden, here comes this thing where you can actually go outside, be with your friends, do something. It's active. And it is an honorable thing to do. I think that is like the dirty secret of that summer, right? It was simply something to do to get you out of the house. And I didn't hear many people talking about that. Yes. So, so far, like, what do you think has been the the lasting effects, if any, of those protests and actions that took place? I saw one study that said that, and this is longer than just the George Floyd protest, but we're in cities where there had been large Black Lives Matter protests that there was less police violence, mostly because there was more pressure to use body cams and things like that. So that's that's a positive thing. Gallup just released polling that shows that race as an issue 
is still relatively high from the last five years. You know, we had had these periods where it didn't even register in the 80s. And then again, in the 90s, late 90s, race didn't even register. There are good things out of it. It's just that if you look at that chart, you see that there are these fallow periods. There's great activity, and then it just falls off the map. And I guess if we're talking about awareness, I mean, that that is so important, but like we can't stop there. That can't be the only thing. I guess like I don't I don't know how that turns into like action and change like from my vantage point. Yeah, I, listen, it is a bigger conversation. It's not even a conversation, it's just action, right? So the 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 issue is you can't really have a truly egalitarian society when you still have a society that materially benefits white people for being white and materially harms black people for being black. There's no way to donate or march your way out of that. You have to start to evaluate that society and realize that some things have to be shifted. And when you say shift, that means that some people have to give up some advantages in order for that shift to really be to occur and for everyone to benefit from the same society in the same ways. People don't want to do that. You have to start to make different decisions about where your kids go to school. That means you have to make different decisions about where you live because all schools are locally zoned. And when you see that wealthier school districts keep drawing their boundaries tighter and tighter and tighter, so it's only about 1,500 people in those school districts, whereas a, a, a public school district that's poor has 10,000 kids, that's what that looks like. I'm glad you brought up these local things, because I think the majority of the discussion right now is around like what can what legislation can be passed and like, should we like abolish a filibuster or not? And that feels so out of reach and like almost impossible to be really honest. So like, I think it's good for people to know, like, even if there is a filibuster, you can like look around your life and say like, how is this acting out? Yes. So before I let you go, one more question, which is that for the majority of your life, you wanted to be a politician. No, not majority. Now I'm old. So that was just like the young part of my life. Okay, many, many years in your life. You were class president in college. I mean, now you're 50. Like, is that completely behind you or is it still in the back of your I have lived too full of life to be a politician. <laughs> Thank you for taking the time for this. This is fantastic. And that was Charles M. Blow. The show he's hosting is called Prime with Charles Blow and airs on the Black News Channel. And then also, if you want to check them out, the books we spoke about are called Fire, Shut Up in My Bones, and The Devil You Know. Now, as always, if you enjoyed this interview, please help us by leaving a comment on Apple Podcasts or whatever app you're listening to us on, and give us a post on social media, please. Doing things like that really are the biggest ways you can help our show continue to grow. We're on Twitter and Instagram at LGBTQPod. I'm on there at JeffMasters1. We love hearing from you every week. We're brought to you by The Advocate Magazine in partnership with Glad. I'm Jeffrey Masters. I will see you next week. Bye.